Hello, my name is Ricardo Sai, and welcome to the next episode of uh, An Espresso with uh, uh, Ricardo. I'm here today with uh, Emma Weiner, who is a speaker coach. Uh, so, Emma, welcome. Thank you, Ricardo. Lovely to be here. Good to see you. And uh, Emma, do you want to tell us a, shortly um, a bit about yourself and what you do? Certainly. I'm a speaker coach. So I help people raise their visibility and their credibility in their workspace. So that could be in a corporate space or as an entrepreneur. And I do that through voice coaching. So I work with clients to help them speak more effectively in any situation at work. So that could be interviewing, it could be networking, presenting, doing TED talks, those kind of ideas. So the idea is that they are more able to help their message land with their audience, which could be one person or it could be a thousand after they've had coaching with me. So as uh, uh, it's always quite strange to do, you know, to, to do a, an espresso where I interview uh, an expert like, like yourself, you know, I always feel a bit like, uh, oh, I need to do a good job interviewing someone like, like Emma. But anyway, here we are, and I'm sure it's going to be fun. And, I, and I, do you like espresso, by the way? Do you I like love it? espresso, but it makes me a little shaky. So none today. <laughs> no shaky today. Good. Well, I had my coffee. I can't, I can't deny that. So anyway, so today the topic is a very, very interesting one. It brings me back to maybe 25 years ago when I used to study, uh, well, a Greek philosopher that you will mention in a second. So we're going to be talking about uh, how to be more influential when uh, um, speaking in public. So um, we are focused in particular in three ways of being more influential. So can you tell us a bit more about the, the theme of today and, and how can we be more influential? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we're going to go back to 385 BC, to this amazing model that Aristotle came up with uh, in 385. And I have to say, we've never come up with anything better. And I love his model because it's it's so simple, but it's really, really effective when we start to look at what he thought was the most persuasive speakers of his time. So he looked at all the orators and he thought, well, what's the most influential person here? And he found that the people who were influential were always consistently doing three things. And those three things he called ethos, pathos, and logos. So let's look at the logos. The logos is logic. So he was looking at what's, how logical is your information? How logical is the flow? Does your argument work? Is there evidence to support your, uh, your argument? And then, so that's one block, this idea of logic. The second block was about pathos, which is about emotion. So is there human content? Is there human stories? Do I understand uh, what you're saying in terms of sort of sensory language? Is it speaking to me as a human being? So that was really important. If that was missing, it was very difficult to connect to the person and they were less influential. And then the final and one of the most important blocks is credibility. So he thought credibility came in two parts and I, I have to agree with him. Uh, so the first part is your lived in values. So do you do the say, do the things you've said you're gonna do? So, you know, quite regularly in the British press recently, we've seen politicians saying they're gonna do one thing and then doing something else. So their lived in values get sort of degraded by the fact that they're not doing what they said they would do. But when it comes to speaking, your credibility is really about the delivery. So it's how you show up, how you walk onto that stage or how you hold that meeting room or hold the Zoom if, if it's on a, in a virtual scenario. So it's really about how do you deliver? What do you do with your body, your breath and your voice to give your audience that sense of, of credibility? So we have to have those three things, credibility, logic and emotion to really be persuasive. That's that's fantastic. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, and, and again, you know, really reminds me of uh, when I used to study philosophy, Greek philosophy back in the days, uh, a few decades ago. But uh, um, our espressos are all about storytelling as well. So yeah. I wanted to ask you more about that. You know, so how can we be more influential uh, using these three um these three um, these three ways, uh, these three different uh, uh, approaches, uh, and how is so? What? How about the storytelling element? You know, is that part of that? You know, is that an extra thing? You know, so can you elaborate a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that Aristotle talked about was the relationship between three really key elements. So the audience, 
the material and the speaker. So obviously as a speaker, we have a relationship to the things that we're talking about. We know, we know it, we've lived it, we understand it. Now our audience may or may not have a relationship with, with that information, but hopefully by the time we finish speaking, they will certainly have a relationship with us. And the same goes with our personal relationship with the audience. We may or may not know them. So using story is an amazing way. It's such an efficient way to be persuasive, to be influential and for our audience to get to know and like us. Because remember, audiences have to move along that know, like and trust path pathway we can never make anybody trust us but we can lead them along that pathway to help them get to know and like us and using personal story is an amazing way to do that because essentially you're saying to somebody look this is my lived experience so there's the emotional bit you know we talked that that block in um the credibility triangle that block that emotional content look this is what happened to me this is how I went through this process or this part of my life this journey and we're sharing it with somebody else so they feel like they're getting to know us and like us and that we're sharing some emotional content now the story needs to be logical it's got to flow it has to kind of go a b and then c or and stories work brilliantly like this as well. We start with the ending. We know what happens and we work backwards to find out why that happened. So it doesn't matter wh which way it flows, but it has to flow and there's got to be a reason for it. And then the final bit is that credibility. So how we deliver that story. So if it's a very emotional story, um, you know, if it was something traumatic that we're talking about and lots of people do share, you know, very personal stories, we have to be okay in delivering that. So we have to show the audience that we're in control and we're okay, we're past that, that trauma or that really sort of stressful time in life. And look, we've come out the other side. And we're not, doesn't mean we don't, we're not, we might have war wounds, we might have some bruises and bumps, but we've come out the other side. So it's really important that we make our audience feel comfortable, show that we're comfortable, make our audience feel comfortable with the content because then they're listening to the content, not worrying about us. So that's when the credibility of delivery comes in. You know, can we deliver that story with enthusiasm? Can we change our tone of voice to make sure that the story is congruent with what we're saying? Can we build anticipation? Are we using gesture to support the story? It's a really important uh, way of engendering trust is by, by telling stories. Does that make sense? That, yeah, and, and, and I must say that while you were talking, I was observing your, the way you're using your hands. And it's, it's really interesting because uh, I think we are also visual animals in a way so we we understand better things uh, if there is a visual element uh, and uh, and uh, that's where you know my job comes to uh, this is why i do my job as well because i mean i do photography and films and i do believe that we can uh, we can really uh, make a difference uh, with using images and you know they they stick better uh, um, those messages if you're using uh, a story yeah. but if you're using images to tell that story so Absolutely. yeah very interesting so yeah, yeah. stories are they're sticky that you know they stick with people they're far stickier than than data and if we can sort of like you say add in those visual elements those ideas of of where things sit in space then it's much easier for our audience to remember. So sensory language, placing things in space so that we know where they are, and we can come back to them later on in the story, really, really important. So that visual element is, is yeah. an essential part of storytelling. You know, if I sat here and told a story and I didn't move at all, and I didn't yeah. inflect my voice at all, you'd turn off, in, you know, you'd switch off in a couple of minutes, if that, probably seconds. So how you use your body to support the story, how you use your voice to support the story and build tension and anticipation. All those things are vital. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I could listen to you for hours, I must say, Emma. So you <laughs> definitely know how to talk. So <laughs> uh, very engaging. Um, so uh, just to wrap up a bit, uh, these uh, uh, incredible espressos there we, we, we've been sipping together. Um, so uh, what? Why? So how can you help people? Why are you passionate about your, your job? So what's your story as well? Because, I mean, we also are very fascinated by what's the story yeah. behind your business as well. So, so why, why do you like helping people? And how do you like how do you help people through your job as well? What is driving yeah, so, you? Well, why do I do my job? Um, I have 
I think Jacinda Ardern is an amazing communicator. I think she's incredible. I think she's an amazing politician. And I think she's an incredible communicator. So when I'm doing my work, my kind of secret, not so secret because I have spoken about this before, but my secret passion behind it all is like, I'm helping people become communicators like her and I'm sending them out into the world to do amazing things because the people I work with do incredible jobs and they, they, they have such interesting passions and they're making a difference in the world. And so I'm helping them be more effective in doing that. So I, I get a really a, a wonderful buzz by giving them these skills because speaking is a skill. It's like riding a bike, it's like baking a cake, it's like driving a car. None of us woke up being able to do that. We, we learned how to do them and speaking is exactly the same. You can learn how to do it. And I know that because I was a very confident speaker. I ran a, a business, I spoke in front of hundreds and thousands of people and didn't bat an eyelid. Then I had my children and I had two very complicated, highly medicalized pregnancies that were very, very stressful. And then I just lost my confidence. I lost my confidence to speak in front of people. I, I was really struggling to make even basic conversation. And I'm like, this isn't me. I know that I can do more than this and I want to learn how to do it again. And so I did a master's degree in voice coaching and training. I'd always been fascinated by storytellers and presenters and people who could hold the room. And I'd always watch them. And I was like, right, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to do my master's and I'm going to find my voice again. And that's exactly what happened. It was in incredible. It was transformational, that, that master's degree on so many levels. And now I get to do that as my job. I get to go out and I help other people find, hone and finesse how they speak to the world. And it's, I love it. I absolutely love it. That's, that's, that's really, really inspiring, uh, Emma. Uh, by the way, just I have a little um, uh, something to share with you. So a few years ago, I worked with uh, Tony Robbins. Uh, so uh, what, a, what a speaker, what a communicator he is. You know, I, I must say it does help the father. He's two meters tall. His <laughs> hands are probably the size of my head, if not bigger than that. When he shook my hand, it, I mean, that guy has got some energy, I'm telling you. Yeah. So he, we, we interviewed him in a, in a hotel room. He nearly reached the, the, the ceiling of the <laughs> Of the hotel room so wow. that guy is massive you know so yeah. and i mean his voice is so powerful and uh, so but yeah definitely it's um, I, i'm i'm sure he's a it's, you know he's, he's an incredible person so mm. um, um uh, just to wrap up uh, have you got any kind of final tips for uh, our audience any kind of uh, nuggets of wisdom uh, any how can quickly people i mean obviously you know if people want to learn more about the services that you offer they can go on your website which is yeah. um here uh, below uh, but have you got any final tips? yeah i would say always start where your audience are so when we're speaking we often in this like look at this shiny thing and look at this amazing look, this is incredible over here you know whether we're selling an idea whether we're selling a, a, a you know a product or an offering always go to where your audience are start where they are tell a story about where they are and then very gently lead them towards this new thing because however much they might need what you have or this idea it might feel like a too much of a trek for them so go to them start your story where they are and gently lead them across that's always the best way rather than going well i can do this and i can do that and i can do the other mm. it might not it, it isn't going to land start with them that would yeah. be my biggest tip. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your wisdom and your experience. Pleasure. Great. Uh, thank you, Emma. I, I hope you enjoyed this espresso. I surely did. And, uh, and uh, see you very soon. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Ricardo. Take care. Bye now. Bye.